let's get started. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, I guess everyone who's on the call has power. I know some students lost power, maybe if you live, I don't know where, but you guys are all here, so thank you. Um, uh, so please feel free to like uh, ask a question at any point, just like in class. Um, you can unmute yourself and then talk. Um, also, there's the chat window that hopefully everybody can see, and you could like type a hello there if you just want to like show that you can use it and just say hello. That would be fine. Um, so the plan for today is um, okay. So I've already typed in the agenda. So um, we're going to be continuing this conversation about higher order procedures and specifically this sum and product of series thing with procedures as parameters. I kind of feel like we mostly got it by the end of class on Wednesday, but uh, we'll do a little bit more. Um, and uh, then I'm going to give some examples of um, first order functions. So the idea here is not only can procedures be arguments, but they can be return values. And we'll go through um, some examples of that. And I'll also show a uh, like diagram of, of how to think about what's going on when we do that. Um, any questions before we jump in or requests, you know, things that people have been thinking about that you want to make sure we talk about? Okay, well, if at any point, like, something comes up, like, you can type it in the chat, and I might, like, respond to it right away or save it for later. So we could just keep that going. Um, okay, so let's look back at this, the, um, the basic procedure for uh, making a sum of the series that we went over in class last time, and this is straight out of the book. This is the version that's in the book. It's also, I've got it written out here. It's annotated on um, this drawing, that, which is from the last class. Um, one of the nice things actually I wanted to show is when you're in the Racket Editor um, and you highlight something, wait, this is not working now. Hold on, let me recompile. Oh, wow. This used to work. When you highlighted one of these procedures, it would like show you which ones it was connected to. Why is it not doing that now? Oh well. What I was going to show is like when you highlight like the next. It do people seen this in your own views that then it shows you that this next and that next are the same one. Have people yeah, seen that? See that when you're editing it um, yeah. before you actually run the racket interpreter. Right. So meanwhile, now it's not doing that. Okay. Well, in any event. Um, all right. So this procedure will recursively generate a sum of a, a, a series of numbers that begins at A and ends with B. Um, it takes each A at, at, the, at the top of the recursion and, and operates on it with this term procedure, which is a procedure that does something to A. And we can see that here. So um, we're go each time through the recursion, we're going to transform A with that term procedure and then recursively call ourselves um, to do the next one in the series. The way we get the next one is by using the next procedure, which we've also handed into this procedure. This one would for example, be an, a procedure that adds one to a number to generate every number between A and B, or it can be some other um, way of advancing A. Um, here, we're handing the next procedure back into the recursive call, and here, we're, we're handing the B parameter back into the recursive call. So the thing that we did at the end of class um, on Wednesday was we did the sum of every odd integer from minus 100 to 200. And so what we realized we had to do there, this one was tricky, but we realized we had to have the, the term procedure to be a filter for the number, for the A. And either it would produce the number if it was odd, or it would produce a zero if it was even. So we'd be adding in all the zeros. So we ended up with something like this. Um, we called sum 
and we're going to make a lambda procedure which will serve as the term procedure. So we can do this all in one line. So if n, if n is odd, then we produce n, otherwise we produce zero. So that that's the the becomes the term procedure. And then we're going to go from minus 100. And now we need a next procedure. Um, that will be the procedure that adds one. And up to 200. Um, and so now if we evaluate the buffer, we'll actually get the answer. will show up in the REPL. Um, so I, I think this might be the first time I've done this where I've put an actual line of code in the um, procedures buffer, but you can do that to see what um, will happen. Um, you can't leave these in when you submit your, your code for the auto grader because this will confuse it. But if you're just like writing things that you want to test out, you can totally do that. Um, all right, let's, let's, um, let me give you guys another challenge and you guys can work on it for a minute and then we'll review the answer. So this will be like challenge number three. That last one was number two. This one should be easier. So this is just warm up. So let's do a sum of squares of the numbers from one to 100. So for example, we'd want one squared plus two squared and so on up to 100 squared. So write the line of code that uses the sum procedure to do that. So if you guys want to take a minute um, and boot up your own copy of bracket, or you could do it on paper, either way. Um, but let me just give you guys a minute to work that one out. You could type ready into the chat when you're like ready to talk about it. And as soon as we have a quorum, then we'll, we'll talk. Hey, Michael, are you still there by phone? Yeah, I'm just keeping my phone mic muted. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's funny. Like, my view does not show how many people are joined by phone. So you might be the only person, but there might be others, and I won't know about them. <laughs> All right, so... Um, all right, let's uh, let's like work this one through. Okay, so um, I realize that not everybody said they're ready, so I'll, I'll try to break it down a little bit more. So we're going to be calling sum with like uh, it, so if we look at the parameters of sum, it's there's the four parameters. There's this procedure term which transforms the term each time through. 
there's the starting number in the sequence, there's this procedure next, which generates the next number in the sequence, and then there's the ending point. So, like, we're going to have some procedure. We're going to have the starting point is 100. It, sorry, is 1. We're going to have the, end, uh, the advanced procedure, and the ending point is 100. So that's the form of what we're doing here. Um, all right, let me... Um, let me, instead of doing it all as one line, let's like write the, the separate procedures for the PROC and advance. So the PROC procedure in this case, it's, we're gonna, we're, we want to square each of the numbers. We're, we're making the sum of the squares of each number. So we, we basically need the square procedure. So we can do it like this. That's a, a procedure that squares things. Um, and then the advanced procedure is, is just going to need to add one. So it's, um, it's just like the one we used above. I'll, I'll give it a name now. We'll call it inc for increment. So that takes its argument and adds one. So now we've got those two procedures. They're each a procedure of one number. And now we can put it all together. So we can say sum of the squares starting at one, sorry, just square, and increment each time and end with 100. And now we can evaluate the buffer and we should see the answer displayed below. We'll still see the 7500, but we'll see a new number as well. Did anybody run it and get that answer? Can, can we confirm that? No, all right, that's fine. I think it's right. Um, so, like again, unpa unpacking the recursion, like basically what we got was the first time through the loop, we got like one way to think about it is we got. Let's look. Let's go back and get this this procedure, the sum procedure, back on the screen. Here we are. So this is what we're what we've got. So if we think about the first time through the loop, we, we, we're running this code, sum square of 1 inc 100. The first time through, we're like, is, is 1 greater than 100? Like, no. So then we're going to execute this, we're going to carry out this plus thing. So it will transform the 1 with the term procedure, which is square. So square of 1 is 1. And then it'll make a recursive call to ourself of sum. So now I'm filling out the what happened here. Um, so we're going to recursively call ourselves. Term is the procedure we were given, which is that square procedure. Next A. So what does that do? That will apply our increment procedure to A, which is 1. So we'll increment one and get two. And then it will hand in the increment procedure and it will hand in a hundred. So using the substitution model, this is what we get. And now like we can't do the addition yet. I'm going to put a semicolon at the beginning of the line here so that I can hit return on it. Um, we, we can't do, we can't actually do the addition. We have to figure out what that sum square two inc 100 is. So we've got this delayed addition and now we're going to rerun sum plugging in square two increment 100. So we're back into another version of ourselves here and we're okay. Is two greater than a 100? No, it isn't. So now we're going to do another plus. And now we're going to apply square to A, which is a concrete number. A is 2 at this point. So we can square 2 and get 4. And then we're going to add the 4 to another recursive call. So we're going to call ourselves. We're going to hand in the square procedure. And here's another case where we can actually do the work. Next 
we when we first got started we handed an increment so next is the increment procedure we can increment two and get three and then we pass in the increment procedure and we pass in the 100 and this is like three close friends so you can see that this is the recursive process where we've got this delayed um, chain of additions finally at the end it's going to be the last number to be squared is going to be 100. It's going to be, so we're going to square 100 and get 10,000. And then we're going to recurse on ourselves. And now we're going to increment 100 to get to 101. And we'll be at this with however many close primes are needed. And when this thing runs the if will be true 101 is greater than 100 and will just return zero so this thing will get replaced with a zero and then 10,000 will get added to zero and produce 10,000 and that will then return up and we'll get whatever 99 squared was we'll get 10,000 add to that and it will return up and so on so all those things will unwind and we'll finally get the answer. Okay, any questions or comments on that? I was just wondering if the record interpreter knew that the parameters are procedures um, by their definition. Wait, sorry, Connor, say that again. So when you define a procedure, yeah, uh, you declare its parameters. Uh, yeah. Does the interpreter just know that some of the parameters are procedures by the definition of the function? Okay, great question. Right. So does the interpreter know here that n is a number? Uh, likewise, and your specific question is like, does it know that term is a procedure and that next is a procedure? Yeah. Um, so in fact, it does not. Um, there are other languages that figure out what type things are by looking at how you use them. Um, and like, you know, a language could look at this N and say, oh, look, they're multiplying N. That had better be a number. Or, oh, look, they're using term as a procedure because they're applying it to this A thing. So term had better be a procedure. So one of the languages that, um, that does that is Haskell. Um, um, but Scheme doesn't do it. So Scheme doesn't know. Um, and instead, if you fail to provide the right type of thing, you'll get a runtime error. Um, and that's, a, that's something that people don't like about Scheme because when you're building big software projects, you really like the compiler to help you out. And it's certainly doable, but it's not part of the Scheme spec. Yeah, that's a great question. So instead, you'll get an error. So if we were to like type sum, um, and instead of square, let's say we just gave it a number like five. Sorry, my computer is doing something else. And hold on, you guys. I'm on a really slow Mac. OK, there it goes. All right, so if we did sum five, um, starting at one, and yeah, we're going to increment the one and go to 100. What will happen? Well, okay, you guys think about it. where will the error occur? In the addition? Um, it will occur when it tries to apply the term thing to A. It will try to apply 5 to 1, and it will fail. So we should get, like, the error there. Let's see if we can see anything. Yeah, application, not a procedure. Expected a procedure that can be applied to arguments, and it was given a 5. And I don't know why it's highlighting that. That seems completely irrelevant. The error is right, but this is this makes no sense at all. We're, no, we're nowhere near that. Oh, you know what's going on? We've got two versions of sum. And it's confused. 
Um, let's comment this out, and then the error should happen in the right place. I'm going to re rebuild, and let's run that thing again. Yeah, that, uh, there's the error. Um, yep, so you get, you get runtime errors when you did something wrong. Um, there's also a lot of, like, it's not, like, strictly bad. Um, I was positioning it as a liability. It allows a lot of flexibility. Um, so... But in any event, that's the world we're in now. Um, let's do one more of these, and yeah, and then we'll do something new. Okay, so number four in our sequence. So I want you to do a sum of this series. I'm just going to give it by example, and. like that, um, this last one would be, and then have the parameters. So then I want it to be like A, A equals one at the beginning and B equals 1024. So that, that's your starting point for the, your starting ending point for the sequence. So now let's do that one. So I'll move this something down again. So we can see the problem and the thing you're working with. Okay, does everybody understand the problem? Okay. So go ahead and uh, Start working on it, and let me know when you're ready to keep going. Professor? Yeah? I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead, Mohammed. Uh, will this lecture be recorded? Yes. In fact, it is being recorded. Okay, because I, I just missed the first 10 minutes. Yep. Yep. It's, um, it is being recorded. Thanks for asking. Okay. Thank you. I didn't want to tell people beforehand because I thought it might encourage you more to come if you didn't know. <laughs> but yes, I'm recording it. I, but I, there was no reason not to tell all of you right up front because here you were. You wouldn't be like, oh, forget it, I'm leaving now.
So those of you who are still working on it, the the trick with that I intend with this one is to, is for people to realize that the next procedure doesn't have to just increment its input. It can do other things. So the specific idea here is that the next procedure can double its its argument. And then it will like generate um, those very numbers, the one, two, four, eight, and so on. And then all you have to do is add them up. That's kind of the idea. Those of you who like typed in ready, is that the way you did it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yep. All right. So let me just type the code for that. I'm going to do this one as a one-liner. Um, well, actually, I'm going to put it in here because we're going to have like two different versions of sum in the. Okay, so our term. So okay, our term procedure isn't going to do any interesting work. It's just going to take the numbers it's given and accept them. And we're going to rely on the next procedure to advance us to only the numbers we care about. So we're going to use what is called the identity procedure. It's a procedure that just returns its, its input. Um, we're going to start at 1. And then the next procedure is going to do something interesting in that it's going to take its input and double it. So when it's given one, it will produce two, two, four, and so on. Um, and then we need to know when to end, and so we're going to end at 1024. So there it is. Oh, I guess I should have. Well, I don't think I changed anything important in the, in the buffer. Um, it would also be possible to do this by recognizing that I'm doing powers of two, and like one is two to the zero, it, or yeah, one is two to the zero. Two, you could generate the series from zero to 10 and then add it up. So another way of doing it, if I did not specify A and B, like, well, actually, let me give it to you guys. All right, suppose I still want that series, but I'm gonna say the inputs are A equals zero and B equals 10 over that range. So now what's the solution for it in that case? So take a few minutes and do that. Oh, yeah, look, that generated the right answer. <laughs> Mohammed, what we're doing is we're, we're still generating this series, the sum of the numbers from the square, uh, those numbers, but um, this time we're doing it with parameters of A being 0 and, and B being 10. All right, well, let's move this one along. I have a feeling more people are ready than are saying. Um, I'm going to put the answer here. So, okay, so the idea here is we need to recognize that 
um, these are powers of two. Um, one is two to the zeroth power. This would be two to the first, two to the second, two to the third, and so on up to two to the tenth. So we're going to generate a. We're going to work through the series of numbers from zero to ten. Um, so our next procedure is just increment so that when we, you know, we go from zero to one to two and so on. But then the work is done in the term procedure, which will do the exponentiation. So I think we already have an increment procedure. Yep, so we can reuse that. Um, so we just need to um, do an exponentiation as our term procedure. So I'm going to put it here. So we'll inline make an exponentiation. So two to the argument. So this is a procedure that raises two to whatever power it's given. And we are going to start at zero, and then we're going to increment each time. So we'll do two to the zero plus two to the first, and we're going to end at 10. Um, and of course, we should like end up with, we saw this, the sum of all the like powers of two from one to 1024 is 20. 47. So we should get that 2047 again. We reevaluate. And what did I do wrong? Oh, this is interesting. Remember, we were looking in class like, does it matter what order procedures are, are defined in? And I hesitated and I thought it does. And then we tried it and it turns out it doesn't. You can define procedures in any order. So, like, uh, you know, this procedure sum, if it was using some other procedure that was defined later, it would be okay. But here the error is we're trying to actually use sum before we've defined it, because remember, I've been moving it down. So that's why this line is failing now, because sum doesn't exist yet, and we're trying to actually use it. All right, so let's try again. Basically, this is what we're evaluating now. We've got this this is our, our standard body for sum. We've got an increment procedure somewhere off the top of the screen that we're going to be using here. And now we want to run that line of code. Okay, so it worked. All right, any questions? Um, okay, so just as a, like, so you guys, if, if you're like unsure about this, like you should go over the examples again, like hide the answers from yourself and just try the problems again, you know, the problems we've been doing. Um, I want to just show you again the, um, the exercise that you, have, that you have to do in the assignment. Um, Is this legible, this area here? Do people see the, uh, the camera view screen? Ah, that's too small to see, isn't it? Yeah, it's really uh, blurry. Yeah, OK. Uh, all right, so that's all right. Let me, um, let me just do it this way. I'll hold it up like this. Let's see if it can go in focus. Nope. No. No. All right, that's not going to work. Um, I'm going to type it in then. Actually, wait, I've already got it. Hold on, I've already loaded it. Look at this. It's almost like I knew what I'm doing. Where is it? Here we go. So, um, Part of the assignment is to recreate this summation process using an iterative recursion. Um, and let's just like talk through again what each of the pieces are. So it, this is exact same structure as the recursive one that we've been playing with. Um, the, but it uses an iterator. And um, with, with the iterative forms, you are accumulating the answer in this result parameter. So when you're all done, you have, you're going to be returning that result. I don't want to completely give it away, but that's, that's a key bit of information. So the way iterative recursions work is they're a loop 
and each time through you're building up the result so that this result actually uh, it will show up in several places um, it's going to show up as the the final answer of the procedure i'll let you guys figure out where that is it's going to show up here you have to pass it back into itself and there you're you're handing into the iteration the new result the result of doing um, one step of the process so you're going to update the result here so basically you're going to add whatever the the result of um, doing the term procedure to to a gets added into the existing result you also have the base case of the result here which is the initial value of result which um, which is going to be zero and that's equivalent to Basically, you're going to have a zero there. I'm giving that as an answer. The zero that you that you will provide here is the same function as this zero, which is the, the like the base case at the end of the recursion. Um, the other interesting thing to to note about this procedure is that the iterator has access to the term procedure and it has access to the next procedure even though um, it's not like we didn't have to we don't have to hand it in each time like we do with the recursive form and that's because that's only because the iterator is defined inside of the overall thing um, like it's the helper is inside of the other function um, we saw two versions of the helper you can have a helper function that's in its own context, but then you would have to hand in the, the term procedure and the next procedure. Any, any questions about that? How many of you guys already like did that one, like you're done on the a problem set? Okay. All right, good. So a mix of yeses and noes. Um, okay, so, um, Andre, so do you have any, do you feel like, like you, you got it now, Mohammed? does it feel like you have a handle on it? Okay. All right, cool. Um, all right, so I'm going to move on to, uh, the next thing, which is I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about this idea of um, procedures um, as return values of other procedures. Um, so the notion of first order functions means that functions have the same privileges of any other thing in the language. So if we just think about like how numbers are used. Numbers can be parameters to procedures. Um, they, they can be passed around um, and they can be produced as return values. Um, so that's the idea of functions having that same property. Um, like if you think about like the traditional C language, you can provide a function to, uh, another function. You can, there's function pointers, um, but you can't dynamically create functions and return them. So they're not first class that's changed with like the latest version of C++. Um, I don't know if it was in C++ 11 or, um, C++ 14, but C++ has Lambda now. So, you know, we talked about that briefly in class, um, which basically is, so that's why it's great that you're learning Lambda. So if you join a team where they're using Lambda and C++, you'd be like, hey, I know what that's about. Um, okay, so let's look at an example of, um, we want, we're going to write a procedure that, that, takes a parameter and produces a procedure as the return. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a procedure. Um, I'm going to comment this out so it doesn't confuse us when we start like, evaluating. So that was the answer to this one. Um, OK, we're going to write a procedure to um, accept an arg. And um, it will return a function that um, that raises its input to that arg. So it does an exponentiation that like okay so basically 
we are going to make a function that is sort of like, well, all right, I think it might be easy just to just like write out the code for it and then talk through what's going on. Okay, so um, here it is. Actually, Okay, this is the whole thing. Now let's like talk through what's going on. So I'm creating this procedure x exp that um, accepts an argument n. And John, are you typing? <laughs> Someone's typing. Oh, there's John, Ryan, or Tyler, or Jason. One of you guys is typing. Or Alex. Whoops, that was me. I've got a mechanical keyboard and forgot to mute my mic. Okay, that's fine. All right. Um, okay, so um, we've, got this, we've got this function now, exp, that accepts an argument n. And what it does is it produces a function and returns it immediately. This, so this, this becomes the, um, the thing that's created and returned by exp. And it itself is a function of b that uses the built-in exponentiation function to raise b to the n power. So let's play with it. And I think it'll become more obvious what I'm talking about when we um, play with it. So if we call exp of two, it will create a function that will square things. And so what happened is we've done this before, we created a function and then immediately like lost track of it. But notice that tells us where the function lives um, because it's in a buffer. It, so it's actually the function that was created was defined at line 67 of our buffer. So if we go in here um, and it's started at position two. Um, so that's the function that was created and we can see down here um, that it matches where it is in the buffer. Um, but that wasn't too exciting because we created it and then we lost it. But that's a version of square. That's actually a squaring procedure. So we can actually define square oh, I can't type, to be that thing. Okay, why did that go wrong? anybody know? Yeah. Where is already defined. Yep, that's right. We had it up here. So um, I'm going to leave that one in place, and I'll just give this one a different name. Okay. So what's my square? It's a procedure object. It's that same one we were just looking at before, and now we can use it. And it does the thing that we wanted to do. Um, so, how does that work, right? So the 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 ideas that like are part of this are that the whole idea of lambda is this thing that creates um, that creates a function. So there we created it and returned it all in one step. Notice we did not apply it. It, it and um, if we were going to apply it. If, like before when we've been using lambdas, we've been immediately applying them. If we wanted to apply this, we'd need another set of parens. And then like so just that, and notice the highlighting, just that is the creation of the lambda. Um, so that's a, a, a procedure of one R, the base. Um, but And we did not apply it. We just created it and returned it. 
So you could see that the way the parens are balancing, that's what's going on. Um, what's another piece of the story with this in order to make it work? Like how does it keep track of the N? That's the other piece of the story is that when we, we so this N and that N are the same. And um, the, like the profound thing about scheme is it creates a thing. I'm going to give you guys a new term. Um, it creates a thing that's called a closure. And what a closure is, is an environment um, and procedure that are bound together. So in other words, this lambda function that got created when we evaluated um, EXP of two, that includes a binding for N. And that binding for N and the procedure itself come together as a package. And that package is, is called a closure. Um, and so then like EXP two is different from EXP three. Like, both can exist and we could like type in, in a moment, like we could define my cube, which is exp of three. Um, and they each have their own environment frame where N is bound to a different thing. And in fact, they also each get their own procedure object. They don't share the procedure object, um, but each one's procedure object is attached to the environment frame where N has the respective value. So I actually want to draw that. Does everybody believe me that cube will work? Let me just do it. All right, so n is going to be bound to 3. And then when the lambda inside of that runs, it will, um, um, that error doesn't matter. So we can cube 2 and get 8. So I'm going to go to, um, I'm going to go to the drawing and I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it large so that hopefully people can see it. And I'm going to use a big marker. So what happened when, when we typed, um, we typed EXP of two and we evaluated that. Can, can you guys see that? Yeah, pretty big. Okay. So we're, we're going to carry out that expression, EXP of two. So in order to do that, um, so I, I've given you guys two models for the evaluation. One is the substitution model. The other is this environment frame model, which is more like the real thing. Um, and you need the environment frame model in order to make sense of this one. Um, so, N, um, so in order to carry out EXP two, we have to create a binding for N, and N gets bound to two. And in the context of that frame, this, this frame will point up to the like global environment. We're going to ignore that for now. It's not relevant. Um, in the context of this frame, the body of EXP is evaluated. And that body is, that, is this lambda expression. So this body is evaluated in the context of this frame. And, and then that body, when evaluated, creates a procedure object. So it's going to make this procedure object that exists in the context of um, that frame. The other part of the story is when the whole thing finishes, when the EXP finishes, it returns this procedure object. And then at top level, we, um, we made a binding to that that we called um, my square. Let's abbreviate it. This this uh, binding would exist in the global environment, but but the the trick is that when we use my square, it's this procedure which is able to look up uh, symbols in its body in this environment frame. So n is bound to two. When you know when we did the exp of three and we made my cube. There's another frame that gets created in which n is bound to three. And then there's another procedure that gets created 
that has that frame as its um, as it, its environment home. And then we in the global environment we we made the binding to my cube. Any questions about this? Um, let me just like if you guys have a few more minutes, I know we're like at time, but let's just take a look at um, the assignment problems that use this idea. Okay, so um, it's this one. So it's a procedure that returns a procedure that um, that does what? That doubles its argument. Yeah. So you're gonna you're gonna create some procedure like look at that. Now it's doing that. Why does it sometimes do this lookup thing? I don't understand. Um, okay, you're gonna create a procedure that does something to F. It's gonna close over F, the whole thing, again, that term closure. This procedure is closed over the environment where F has a value. F is, what is F? What is the nature of F here? It's bound to some value in the global environment. Um, or in the environment of the function. Okay, sure. That when there's going to be an environment frame that's created where f has a binding, absolutely. So when we when we call double, let me back. Yeah, when double gets called, an environment frame, we're going to do like double of something. We don't know what kind of thing it is yet. Um, when that gets evaluated, f will get bound to whatever that thing is. That's like a question mark is what I'm trying to draw here. So what what sort of thing is the F object? Is it a number or is it something else? So there's a hint with its name that it's F. Um, yeah, okay. Bahela said in the in the in the chat it's an argument. Yes, it's an argument. Um, F is a function. That's the crazy thing. So we're going to be passing a function to this double function. And then, so F is a thing that itself accepts an argument. All right, so I'll, I'm gonna, I, I think I'm gonna leave that there. That's like the big trick of, of this and like you guys actually still have something to figure out. So um, I'll put that in uh, the notes here. F is a function of one parameter. So the the hint is you're going to have to apply f to z in this body here. Cuz you're still going to the argument is still going to be come into your double function. You're you're you can see that your double function is this lambda expression. So your your double function is also going to be a function of some number. Um, yeah, and you know Z is a number, so, and you can see that here, um, like double ink of three is five. So basically, we applied ink twice to get the five. All right, if you have any questions on that. There, right, so this composed one is basically the same story. Um, this exponent one is, in a way, it's less sophisticated. It's still, wait, is it or is it not? No. Actually, uh, I think this one's also pretty sophisticated. These are all in the same category. Yeah, all right. Um, well, we could talk about this more on, I think we'll talk about this more on Monday, and then there's the other stuff that I'm talking about on Monday. 
are um, the let and lambda thing. This is the other part of the story. That's like taken together. That's the whole problem set. So um, any closing thoughts or comments from you guys? Uh, I just have one question. Yeah, go ahead. If I was to find the lecture, where could I find it on the website? Oh, um, I'm going to – I'm trying to upload it to YouTube. I may, if I figure out how, I'll upload it to the lecture capture. But um, I will shortly post a link with with this with the recording. Oh, so it's going to be on YouTube? Okay. Um, either YouTube or Echo 360. But in any, whichever it is, I will send a link to the discussion board. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Thanks for asking, Mohammed. That's a good reminder for me to actually do that. Um, it's, okay. it'll take a little while cause my, I'm on a slow machine and it has to like crank on it in order to make it into a movie file, but then I will do it. So in the next like, you know, couple hours, it'll be there. Okay. Cool. Thanks you guys. Um, have a good rest of your day. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. Bye everyone.